Locate in your Bibles this morning the New Testament letter of 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And in just a moment, we're going to be reading from verse 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 1. Someone uh, has the page number for that. 956. Excellent. 956 in your church Bibles. 1 Corinthians in the New Testament. Letter of Paul to the church in Corinth. Let's read from verse 1. Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are not you my workmanship in the Lord? If to others I'm not an apostle, at least I am to you, for you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. This is my defense to those who would examine me. Do we not have the right to eat and drink? Do we not have the right to take along a believing wife, as do the other apostles and the brothers of the Lord and Cephas? Or is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working for a living? Who serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard without eating any of its fruit? Or who tends a flock without getting some of the milk? Do I say these things on human authority? Does not the law say the same? For it is written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain. Is it for oxen that God is concerned? Does he not certainly speak for our sake? It was written for our sake because the plowman should plow in hope and the thresher thresh in hope of sharing in the crop. If we have sown spiritual things among you, is it too much if we reap material things among, from you? If others share this rightful claim on you, do not we even more? Nevertheless, we have not made use of this right, but we endure anything rather than put an obstacle in the way of the gospel of Christ. Do you not know that those who are employed in the temple service get get their food from the temple and those who serve at the altar share in the sacrificial offerings in the same way the Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. And we're going to stop our reading there. I want to be very clear from the outset that those of us who know us as a church at all well know that we speak and preach very clearly against false, money-grubbing worldviews. Like what is sometimes called the prosperity gospel. The word of faith movement. The health and wealth theology. We are against these things. We are against these things because we believe they are perversions of the good news of Jesus Christ. We are against these things because we believe they are notions that seek to manipulate vulnerable people for the financial gain of corrupt and dishonest, false teaching, religious showmen. And such notions will find no encouragement or welcome in our church. That said, sometimes we run to the other extreme. And in rejecting a prosperity gospel, we embrace a poverty gospel or not a poverty gospel, perhaps as relates to us, but a poverty gospel as relates to our leaders 
And so we can seek success, we can seek financial gain, we can seek material things, but as far as our leaders are concerned, well, you know, they love the Lord and they have apparently taken vows of poverty to do so, and so we don't really have to look after their material well-being. This is, of course, the other extreme, and I know there are uh, places where very much, again, as I've noted, the opposite is true. We must develop a biblical, well-rounded understanding of giving, of finance, of material things for ourselves, and then we should progress from that to how these things relate to those who would lead us in the body of Christ. And I hope that perhaps we will begin to see some of that this morning. It's something that uh, we, we deal with uh, fairly rarely, to be honest. So if you're visiting uh, uh, this morning, I don't want you walking away thinking, oh, another, another sermon about a man talking about money, you know, uh, totally put off uh, that that's that's not what we're about we against such negative guilt tripping fear mongering coercive approaches to money as represented by the prosperity gospel we affirm biblical principles of worshipful christ-centered generous voluntary cheerful giving for the glory of god the advancement of the gospel of our lord and savior jesus christ And the good of our neighbors. Starting with our brothers and sisters in the church. And including, not neglecting, the church's leaders. I say biblical principles, but as you could probably tell from uh, how carefully I'm treading, not all see it that way. I recently received a text from uh, an individual not a member of the church. Uh, He's only visited us a couple of times, um, but has proven to be quite hostile to us and to our beliefs, not just at secondary and tertiary matters, but even at a gospel level. And so periodically he's been sending me texts or emails of a rather sad nature, to be honest, Um, a bit abusive at times. In one of these, he decried what he referred to as your repugnant appeal for funds, apparently uh, noting that giving is to the Lord and that we have an opportunity to give if people uh, in the church are so led, is repugnant. He insisted that we should not have an opportunity to give, nor should we have a receptacle in which to give our Sunday uh, offerings during our Sunday gatherings, but we should simply have faith that people will give. Over this text, um, we have, over against this text, we have the biblical text, texts even such as those we have just read. But the whole testimony of Scripture speaks against this. Giving is approvingly exemplified from the beginning of Scripture Right through to the end, from the earliest days of humanity in the beginning of the Bible, when Abel makes an offering pleasing and acceptable to the Lord. Right through to the end, the book of Revelation, when uh, not uh, so, so, so much has changed, yet the glory of God and the goodness of giving to God has not. The heavenly city is established. And we are told there at the conclusion of the Bible that the kings of the earth will bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it to honor the heavenly king. Furthermore, giving is not simply demonstrated descriptively, but it is commanded prescriptively. Opportunities to give are provided in both the Old and the New Testaments to people living under the discipline of the law and to people living in the glorious deliverance of the gospel. For example, in the Old Testament, we read about a system of tithes. 10% of agricultural or economic income is prescribed by God early in the Old Testament for worship. Always giving has a worshipful element. And the maintenance of the temple and care of those who served in it. 
At the end of the Old Testament, God speaks through his prophet Malachi that withholding these offerings is basically robbing God and depriving his people of much blessing. Then we go to the New Testament. And early in the New Testament, Jesus condemns those who tithe. What? He condemns those who tithe. Not because they were tithing. He's actually very clear that they should not have neglected tithing. But there were other very crucial and important things they were neglecting. They were tithing off of everything. Even their spice rack at home. You know, mint and dill and cumin. He says you tithe everything, but you neglect justice. You neglect mercy. You neglect love. These things you ought to have done without neglecting the others. Paul later encourages the church at Corinth to collect money when they come together as a church on the first day of the week. The stated purpose of that particular offering uh, being associated with, shall we say, a church associational relief project for their gospel partners in the church at Jerusalem. So it should be well established that giving is thoroughly biblical. But something we, and be very honest with you this morning, I uh, am, am less than comfortable talking about sometimes is whether it is right to give with the personal support and maintenance of church leadership in view. Again, my hesitancy is because of the many ways this has been abused and the many ways uh, this has fueled and funded corruption. I know the church benefits most when I am free to do the work of ministry and to devote myself to the preaching of the word, the work of an evangelist, the care of the church, and the peace of our city. I would love for us to to grow in such a way that others could join me in being so supported. And I can say, I believe with a clear conscience, that I work hard and I apply myself diligently to the tasks before me. If that's ever a question in anyone's mind, um, you are free to look at the activity sheets that I prepare uh, from time to time uh, when such questions are asked. Similarly, you're free to examine the church finances at any time. We seek to be very open about such things. And yet I find within myself, despite knowing with a clear conscience that I work hard and the labor is worthy of his hire, there's this hesitancy to discuss financial matters uh, pertaining especially to myself, not so much others, lest they be misunderstood or misconstrued or lead someone into great, someone who is in greater need than myself having to do without. I don't want that. If you are in need, please. Seek to meet your needs. And if you know a brother or sister who is in need, seek to help them and meet their needs. But I can't get out of talking about it now because Paul has talked about it. We're going through 1 Corinthians. We are uh, working our way through this great letter of Scripture And so because the Apostle Paul deals with the subject in the context of a wider argument, which we'll return to next week, uh, we we need to address this very vitally important subject of uh, financially supporting leaders. And I would contend this morning that contrary, uh, my friend who is uh, texting and emailing me various things from time to time, that this is not repugnant, but it is a right. In fact, you should have picked up on that as we read it earlier, uh, that, that it is a right. And what kind of right? First of all, it is a human right. It is a human right to get paid. Let's just put it bluntly. If you are working, you expect pay, do you not? Unless you're volunteering and right up at the very front, it's clear that, that you know, you're not going to expect payment. Or it's made clear to you from the outset that your role 
is of necessity a voluntary role and that there is no ability or capacity at present to be paid, but you agree to that, any other circumstance, you are right to expect pay. You are right to expect compensation. That is a human right. Uh, The Apostle Paul, in the words that we have just read, is uh, wrestling with a number of things simultaneously. There, there's this subtext of people that are saying, oh, Paul's not that great. We're not so sure that Paul is, is an apostle. We're not so sure that he is um, someone who's a servant of God, walking with the Lord. You know, all sorts of things are being said about him. So uh, alongside that, people are doubting as to whether he's really such a sacrificial guy. He's just said, for example, I will eat without I will do without meat. I will never eat meat lest I offend a weaker brother who has idolatrous associations with meat eating. OK, so I'm not going to eat meat. And they're like, oh, yeah, you, 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 you say that, but, you know, you're not in that situation, mate. So, you know, we we yeah, you're not a really sacrificial guy and we're not really sure you're even an apostle. So he begins the, the text by saying Am I not free? He is free. Am I not an apostle? The expected answer is yes, I am an apostle. Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? And again, the answer that that, that he anticipates is yes. Your testimony is that you are on the way to imprison Christians. And you saw Jesus. And Jesus said, why are you persecuting me? And so, so he's like, I, I, I'm, a, I'm free, I'm an apostle, I've seen Jesus, you are my workmanship. And if others doubt whether I'm an apostle, at least look at yourselves and see some good spiritual fruit. I know you're a bit messy, but you, know, you are my workmanship in the Lord. You are a direct result of my ministry, of my proclamation of the gospel. He finds himself in in verse three, uh, he just comes clean about this. This is my defense to those who would examine me. There are people who are 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 examining him in an unfair light. And he just begins to ask, do we not have the right to eat and drink? Do we not have the right to marry? Do we not have the right to uh, devote ourselves fully to the gospel and, and, and be financially supported? And that's kind of where he settles at that point. So he's going through a list of rights, rights that he has sometimes done without. Elsewhere, Paul's clear that he's he's starved. He's he's hungry. Other times we read very clearly in in, in this very letter that, that Paul is a single man. He has the right to eat, but sometimes he goes hungry. He has the right to get married like other apostles, but but he has chosen. Not to. So he can devote himself, as he sees it, more fully to the Lord. Doubtless, those who have chosen to get married believe that by getting married, thereby they are able to to more fully serve the Lord. Each to their own. But he settles at this point about working, uh, refraining from working outside of gospel work for a living. And he's like, who serves as a soldier at his own expense? Do we pay soldiers? It can be argued as to whether they're they're paid appropriately. Whether their uh, uh, benefits package looks after them. From time to time we have two men who worship with us. Who um, are, 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 are not yet trusting fully in Jesus Christ. But, but they are, are veterans. And they're sleeping rough on the streets. And so we could say, maybe they don't get enough pay, but you know what? What's so scandalous about that? They should have been. They should be. They should be paid. We know it. It's deep within us. They need to be looked after. They need to be cared for. And and whatever traumas they experience and whatever mental ailments they have as a result of their experiences. If if you put them in that situation in a foreign country where their friends are dying and where where the you know there's. Havoc and carnage all around. Look after them for crying out loud. And for God's sake, help them. 
It's a human right. He moves on from soldiers and he he says, who plants a vineyard without eating any of its fruit? Farmers. Do they get paid? At least they should have the ability to eat some of the fruit that they're growing, some of the food that they're growing. But I mean, we we know from, from history, that's not always been the case, really. People who were enslaved to tend other people's farms, to serve other people's tables, nice food, good food, lavish food, and they, they have to settle for uh, cornmeal mashed up and mixed with water or something meager like that. Why are we so offended by that? Because it's not humane, it is not respectful. Of the image of God in people. It is not affirming of their humanity. Of, 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 of the necessity that they be well looked after. They work hard in the fields. They should be able to eat of those fields bounty. At a minimum. He keeps going. He says, or who tends a flock without getting some of the milk? Shepherds. And I know living in North London, really urban environment, some of of this is not close to home for us. But there's something that even if we don't really encounter shepherds in our day-to-day life, there's something that God has created within us that cries out for justice for those who are not adequately or appropriately compensated for the work that they do. There are a lot of people like that in our city. There are people who are working minimum wage for quite uh, difficult labor. There are people who are working less than minimum wage for quite difficult labor. And there's something that we we know is wrong about that. And we speak out against that. And we we understand that there is something wrong. Because it's not humane. The Apostle Paul is saying, I as as an apostle, and he's applying it to, to others who lead in the church of God, who devote themselves fully to proclaiming the gospel of Christ, he's saying it is their human right to be adequately and appropriately funded for their labors. But not only is it a human right, it is a holy right, because he then goes on to say... Um, Do I say these things only on human authority? Verse 8. Does not the law say the same? What law? The law of Moses. And what is the law of Moses if it is not the law of God? Those principles which are outlined in the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, Leviticus, Deuteronomy. I got Leviticus and Numbers mixed up. My apologies. They were written, the laws from Exodus 20 on through Deuteronomy, they are written for the purity and the distinctiveness of the people of God. Why is it then that sometimes when when, when we look at the world, people in the world are better supported, better looked after, better cared for at a fiscal level than when we look at the people of God? And by the way, the people of God are, are, are not the guys with the, uh, the, the, you know, the flashy suits and the millions in savings that are uh, prancing about on a stage asking you to buy their uh, blessed handkerchiefs. The people of God are those who are sold out for Jesus and they are happy and they are content wherever they are and in whatever condition they are in because they have Jesus and nothing else matters. But do not take advantage of that. Do not take such people for granted. But enable them to do even more for the glory of God. Empower them to do even more for the gospel of Christ. 
Am I making sense? So, so we, we don't speak simply on human authority, but the law of God says the same. Okay, I can appeal to human rights, but, but, but what about how God has ordered this world and what God has said specifically from the earliest days of, of his covenantal relationship to his people? The law says the same. It's written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain. What does that mean? Is God worried about our farming practices? Well, some people are a bit dismissive at this point, and they would say, oh no, God, God doesn't care about our farming practices. It's something completely different. But God does care about our farming practices, but that wasn't the point. Okay, there are other passages we can go to that um, uh, demonstrate that. And there is a deeper principle here that you, you don't you don't strap up the ox's mouth while he's he's working in the field. But but you, you let his his head loose and his mouth free so that as he is working, he can graze on the grain that is before him and maintain strength and be sustained for the important and hard work that he has to do. And if we look after oxen, surely we ought to look after God's servants in the church. Paul makes this point. Does not God speak for our sake? It's written for our sake. God commands it in the law that those who work hard get something for their work, get something for their labor. More than that, you're like, we're not under the law, we're under grace, right? We're gospel people, not law people, right? I hope so. I mean, we, we, we are free in Christ. And for freedom, Christ has set you free. And so that gives us a right to stinginess. Grace liberates us to take people for granted. Grace frees us to abuse people and to impoverish people and to oppress people who serve in the body of Christ by neglecting their financial, material, health and, and, and um, support as an individual? I don't think so. Not at all. In fact... The apostle says that it is commanded by the Lord, verse 14, that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. So this applies to post gospel people, that those who devote themselves fully to the proclamation of the good news of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, should be utterly free to do so without being burdened about where their next meal will come from. Or how they'll, they'll, they'll feed themselves and their family. And some people are like, you know, can I even get married? I'd like to get married, but would I be able to look after my wife financially? And then kids? Throw kids into the mix? I don't know. You see what I'm saying? And so Jesus has commanded... Because Jesus is the Lord. He's just said that in chapter 8. There is one Lord, Jesus Christ. And so Jesus, who is the Lord, has commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. It is a thoroughly Christ-like concept. It is a human right. It is a holy right. And furthermore, it is a hope-filled right. Right. Because he says there in verse 10, it, the plowman should plow in hope. He's working out in the field. The oxen is there. And, 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 and they're pulling this plow and the plowman is 
pushing the plow and he's every now and then they, they hit a stone and he gets under it and he has to, to fish the stone out and throw it off. And, you know, the, the oxen are there. And guess what? Because of the law of God looking after them, the oxen are grazing. The oxen are chomping on bits of grain here or there. And the plowman doesn't have any food. And the plowman's hungry. And the plowman's weak. And the plowman is sweating. And the plowman is hot. And it's just, it's just, any, anyone who's done physical labor knows the feeling that I'm talking about. Where you're absolutely drenched and, 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 and you're back is sore and your legs are like lead and you, and and your arms are numb and you're it's kind of a nice feeling but it's a bad feeling as well um, and you're just pressing on why do you press on because you hope that at the end of this hard work you're going to get paid and and you hope that at the end of this hard work you know, you'll, you'll, you'll be able to relax with a cold beverage and a hot bath and a nice meal. But what if that's not afforded to the plowman? What quality of work will he, will, will, will he have? Well, it really depends on the plowman and his work ethic, I guess. There, there are some of us who would just keep going, keep doing it anyway. But... Um, Most of the time, it's a bit shoddy. And the plowman plows because he's looking to a hope that he'll be looked after. The thresher threshes, swinging away at the grain in hopes that at the end of the day, she'll be able to gather it And be able to use it to uh, provide bread and bake goods and things for her family and friends. There will be payment. There will be a meal. There will be an opportunity to relax. And the plowman and the thresher both proceed in hope with faith that they'll be looked after. And so Paul is applying this to his human and holy right to receive support. And he's saying really anyone and everyone who is preaching the gospel should have the same hope that they will be looked after. And looked after well, not to sustain a life of opulence, but Comfortably enough to not have to worry. And yet Paul hasn't made use of this right. I'll be talking about that more next week. But I, I, I can't help getting, getting ahead of myself at this point. There are some seasons... Where it is very difficult for the people of God to adequately support those who would lead them. There are some contexts where a person must receive some and perhaps for a time all of their support from elsewhere because of the economic status and the the personal situations of the people to whom they are ministering. There are spiritual reasons for which sometimes the, the, the person who is seeking to preach the gospel, whether that's an elder or an evangelist or whatever he is in, in the body of Christ, um, will choose not to take hold of this right. For three years, I served as the assistant pastor of this church. Before I was the assistant pastor, there were talks about, you know, stipending. But I didn't draw a stipend for those three years. I worked. And I believe I can say again, as as always, I worked hard. But I forewent my right to claim that, to press for that, to... Try and get that in some form. 
I was fed in house and clothed though, and I was content. The first month as pastor, I didn't draw a salary. I did not receive a salary. And that was, again, voluntary. Because I wanted us to have just that extra month more of, 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 of cushioning so, so that it wouldn't be such a burden going forward to support me. I'm not saying that to puff myself up or to, to say anything, you know, uh, like, what a great guy. Isn't he amazing? Um, because that, that's, that's not what I'm interested in. What I'm saying is that there are seasons where it seems right, maybe not to the congregation, but it seems right to the pastor to forego that for the glory of God and the advance of the gospel. Or in the situation at the present, to work two days, broadly speaking, in a ministry position, but outside of the, the church. So that I'm able to adequately support myself and my family. It's a sort of halfway between what Paul is saying you have a right to and, and, and what Paul is doing. Right? Why? Why do people do this? Convenience? They're super spiritual people? They're just really, you know impoverished and, 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 and like it? I believe it's because there's a greater hope than the hope of the plowman and the hope of the thresher. There is a greater hope than the hope of the soldier, the hope of the farmer, the hope of the shepherd, that they will get a payday. There is a hope that, that makes a, a, a pastor, an elder, lay down even this right to the most basic of human rights, payment in exchange for service. There is a hope that takes such a person beyond those points of sacrificing rights when they need to, to sacrificing their rights when other people need them to. Hope that there is a greater treasure that they will one day obtain hope that, that makes you desire other people obtaining their treasure and obtaining that and pursuing that to the point they are prepared to step back and push them forward into such a, such a pursuit of the glory of God at their personal expense because that person's eternity is greater than my temporary compensation. Hope that one day when the pastors and elders of the churches die and they will go to their eternal home and it will be said of them, I hope it will be said of me, they have fought the fight. They have finished the race. Henceforth, there is laid up for them a crown of righteousness. Not because of anything that, that they have done, but because of everything that Christ has done. Because they fought the fight because Christ was worth the fight. They ran the race because Christ was the prize before them and He was the joy that was before them and He was worth pursuing. And they cross the finish line. And there's hope that they'll be welcomed by the Lord Himself. Who will give that crown of righteousness to them. And will say, well done. Good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of my rest. But we've lived our life doing without. We've lived our life laying down our rights. And I guess we've just gotten used to it. Because we're told at the end of the scriptures that surrounding the throne of the Lord are elders. 
It numbers them, 24 elders. And the elders of this world who have gone to be with them will join them, I believe, in laying down their newly won crowns. Casting them at the feet of the Lord enthroned in glory. We we, we will once more do without. For what is a golden crown on a servant's head? Before a glorious king who alone is worthy. They will cast their golden crowns before the Lord. Seated upon the throne saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. So give because God is worthy. Give because your brothers and sisters are needy. But ultimately know that one day, everything, all all hope, is encapsulated not in the material of this world, but in the eternal treasures that await us in Jesus Christ. The apostle said when they were asked if, 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 by, by a beggar uh, for money, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I to you. And what was it that they had? But the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.